Warning, this content is for entertainment and educational purposes only. This video is brought to you by First Detachment Nutrition. Battle tested, expert formulated. Use discount code AB10 at checkout for 10% off. I, I never found a need ever to go past 750 megs of test. All right, folks, I have a good one for you today. Nick Walker and Guy Cicernino on the Mutants in the Mouth podcast talk about their philosophies on steroid cycles. And it's the same crap that I've been telling you. You hear it from the horse's mouth. Nobody ever wants to believe what I have to say <laughs> about this stuff. But it's enlightening listening to what they have to say. And you can pick and sort of choose and extract information from it. But I am going to dig into it and give you my thoughts on all of it in one second. I, I never found a need ever to go past 750 megs of test. Did I do it? Yes, there was a few weeks where I went to a thousand to see if there would make a difference and right. it never did. But for the most part of my career, my test level was between five and 600 and it never really had to go above that. You get to a point in your career where you, you, you don't need that anymore. You know, you built enough to where, you know, 600, seven, whatever, that's five that's enough to still make small jumps versus doing this large amount that you just don't need anymore. And then you ruined your physique. So guy talks about here how he never really went past 750 MIGs of tests in his career, pushed up to a thousand a few times. I said it in my other video about what the pros take that they usually run somewhere between 750 and 1500 milligrams of testosterone in the off season. Some guys on the lower end, some guys on the higher end guy would be on the lower end of that spectrum and nick chimes in also about how you blow out your physique if you keep pushing high doses of gear now that being said you can read between the lines here and what nick said that you get to a point where you don't need a whole lot to maintain that physique or make small progress changes you can infer from what he's saying here that there were points in times where you push the gear even higher. Now, keep in mind, the guy was a 212 competitor, so he never had to be that big, and he was limited by a weight cap cutoff. So these guys that are 212 or classic physique, these guys don't have to push the doses that high once they achieve a certain amount of size. It does not take a ton to maintain a physique. I've said that a million times. Once you have established your physique, created a new point of homeostasis, it doesn't take a lot to hold on to that physique. So that is a good point here to keep in mind. Now with Guy, he's a smaller dude than Nick. I would venture to guess that Nick has probably pushed the doses higher at some point. Now, I got the impression that maybe he's running lower doses now because he doesn't need that much to maintain where he's at. Do you feel since you and Matt have done this long enough, I mean, I know I did. I found the things that I was like, these are the things that I like to take in the off season. Like my yes. off season was always like, it was usually sussed and a draw. And then maybe it, it was like EQ or it was NPP. And then my pre-contest was always very similar. Like it was always like test EQ and then EQ would get dropped. Then it was master on. And sometimes trend would get added in and primo and like, then you add in like oh. rolls toward, you know, but what? Sometimes trend. Yeah. I didn't always add in trend pre-contest. Really? Yeah. Sometimes trend. Interesting. Yep. Mm-hmm. All right, so this part's funny. Nick puts the time out on the, hey, you didn't take trend on contest prep. This is sort of the old school versus the new school philosophy for contest prep and off-season cycles. Clearly, Guy Nino is an older dude. He's, he's I, I don't know what his age is, but I'm guessing he's around 40. So uh, the guys that were around in the early 2000s, the typical off-season was the test, 
EQ, MPP, and a draw stack. That's what dudes did. That's sort of the old school bodybuilding, get big in the off season uh, stack. He mentioned Sustanon, which is what a lot of the old school guys do. I tell people this over and over again, testosterone is testosterone is testosterone. There's no difference between Sustanon and just taking testosterone and anthate or cypionate. It's all the same thing. It's all testosterone, just different esters with different speeds at which it hits your system. I do laugh about the trend part because a lot of guys now just take trend for granted. I remember, you know, wasn't that long ago, 15, 16 years ago, you couldn't buy trend that easily. A lot of the guys used to take the cattle pellets in Phenoplex and convert them into trend. Trend was a relatively newer thing in the early 2000s. Now, there was Parabolin before that, but it's interesting to hear the old bodybuilders talk about Parabolin. They don't even realize, most of them, don't even realize that it is trend. And now trend is a standard part of contest protocol. The old school dudes, a lot of times, didn't run trend. It was just things like test, master on, wind straw, maybe some halo testing. Uh, you know, it was just very, very uh, basic stuff. Maybe drop the test and go to more DHT derivatives at the end of a contest prep. But that was sort of the old school contest prep methodology. Not all the guys use trend. Now trend is mandatory for contest prep. So for me, I think, you know, we, we, I think my favorite is uh, for the off season. I don't do worlds in the off season. I don't like worlds in the off season. Now because just if you're going to say that, I just want you to say, well, I want to know if your reason is the same as the, my reason. Because I we'll, we'll do orals in prep. So I personally don't want to do any orals in the off season going into a prep. To give your... I, my, my version of an off season, obviously we're going to touch shit, but it's, it's as much, it, it's almost to stay healthy in a healthy range. Because we all know when you get in a prep, Shit, shit goes hard a little bit. Yeah, it is. What, so for me, I I like to do test EQ with a little MPP, but the dosages always stay very moderate. I, I never, I don't like to push too high, um, and then depending on the time frame, it might just go right into the prep. Yeah, or we'll take a good little like, little break in between, and then start prep. All right, so a couple things to touch on here. First, Nick talks about how he does not run orals in the offseason. This is another thing I've said in my other videos that modern pros do not run orals in the offseason. They don't contribute anything uniquely special for the offseason that you can't get from other safer injectables. You give your liver, you give your kidneys a break. You give your stomach a break. Orals are just not the best choice for an off-season. They crush your lipids. They crush your appetite. They increase liver stress. You know, Anovar is sort of mild on the liver stress. So if you were going to use an off-season oral, Anovar might be a choice that you could use. But I'm telling you that most of the guys now do not run orals in the off-season. I do still see some guys running Anadrol here and there. I do see some guys that use Anovar and spot duty in the offseason, maybe pre-workout. But for the most part, a lot of the newer guys are staying away from orals in the offseason. Also, Nick talks about how he likes to run test, EQ, and Nandrolone in the offseason. Most of the pros I see now run some combination of test, EQ, and Nandrolone or test, Primo, and Nandrolone in the offseason. That is a typical pro off-season cycle these days with no oral anabolics and they stick with those compounds in the off-season. They don't push the doses usually as high as you do on contest prep. He even mentions here that shit gets real on contest prep, that basically that's when you throw the kitchen sink at the wall and that's what I have seen, that most guys push the doses up high and get aggressive with things, especially the orals towards the end of contest prep. That's when stuff gets nutty and pro bodybuilder uh, cycles is during contest prep. I have a video up about pro contest prep cycles. I have one of a real contest prep cycle from a real pro you can look up uh, in my uh, playlist on cycles, pro cycles. I think it's over there, but there, you can go in and see how nutty a real pro contest prep cycle gets and how many orals they run towards the end of it and how stupid it gets. Now, I'm not saying 
everybody does it that way, but that's the way a lot of the guys do it. And it's always the dudes that come at me and say, well, I don't, I'm a pro and I don't run that much. It's usually the men's physique guys that tell me that it's usually the smaller dudes that say that I'm telling you the open class guys throw the kitchen sink at it. At least most of them. Now I will say this, once you have established your size, you do not need to run as much as you do when you're initially starting your career. That's just how it goes. I'm not saying this is what you should do, but this is what some of the pros do and how nutty it gets at the pro level. So you don't take orals for a health reason, not because, because most people you'll hear say they, they don't that. like, yes. I don't have that problem. Yeah. So, I just so, feel like when you're in prep, you know, just, you know, you got your windstroll, you got your, your Anabar. Halo, Anabar, yeah. Proviron. Yeah. This. So this is another one where guys called me out and said, there's no way that everybody's taking all this stuff on contest prep. Listen to what he said. He said they're taking Winstrol, Halotussin, Proviron, and Anavar. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, <laughs> these are all the orals that usually get thrown in at the end of a pro contest prep cycle. Now, I'm not saying that everybody does that once again. But the, the just goes back to show you what I had in the previous video, which I verified that the cycle was real. This is what these guys are doing at this level. But I've heard of people when they start carving up pre-contest, add in Anadrol. And I've heard and that, it works wonders. I've never done it, but I've heard it works crazy. I hear a lot of, I've heard nothing but good things. Me but too. I've never, I've yeah, I'd be it. interested to see how that works. I've never done it. All right, so here's another one. You guys think I'm over here just making this crap up. He talks about how some guys run and a draw at the end of contest prep. <laughs> it's exactly what I've heard too, that some dudes run and a draw to fill out at the end of contest prep. And this is another one that I brought up in my previous video about pro pre-contest cycles that everybody said I was nutty about. <laughs> so... I, you know, just so for you guys that think I'm making this crap up, this is what these guys do. You're hearing it from the horse's mouth right here. Nick and Guy are telling you right now what they are taking. Even the older you get, you can you find yourself being able to get away with doing less. A hundred percent. And still get in the shape as if you were doing double when you were younger. Because you have that muscle maturity and you yeah. get that density to your muscle where you don't need the, because now you're, you don't need the amount of anabolics to build because now you're just trying to maintain, right? It's the difference between getting to the top of the sport and maintaining it, right? The difference of getting there and having stamina. So yeah. <sighs> I feel like these guys have basically validated everything that I've been saying on this channel for the last year. So this is another one that drives me absolutely nuts with the gym bros when they tell me, you're lying that it doesn't take much to maintain once you've achieved a certain size. I I'm running 250 milligrams of testosterone. Actually, I'm running 125 milligrams of testosterone. I forgot that I was even running a lower dose. And I'm maintaining my body weight at around 275, 270, somewhere in that range. It doesn't take a lot to maintain once you've achieved a certain size. And the people that say that's impossible are the ones that have never done it. Always. It's never the dudes that have been big that say, well, you can't maintain on TRT doses or you can't maintain on lower, lower doses. As you get to a certain size, it doesn't take a ton to maintain it. Now, that's not to say you don't have to push the gas pedal down to get there. That's certainly true. There are points where you have to do more to get to a certain size. That's just how it works. Now, once you have achieved that size, it is pretty easy to maintain it with the caveat that you are maintaining your diet and you're still keeping your training intensity to high. I think that's where dudes uh, get into this conundrum of believing that they are losing all of their size when they come off or they just have fake gains. They just got bloated and fat from taking D ball and they get off of it and they lose all that bloat and they think they've lost muscle. They haven't actually lost muscle. You just lost all the bloat and water that you were carrying from taking your stupid ass D ball. Uh, so that's not what's happening. You aren't losing muscle. You're losing <laughs> intracellular water. That's it. So 
once you have real contractile tissue, it is hard to lose real contractile tissue. You basically have to try. You hear of guys coming out of pros that need to downsize for health reasons, and it takes them years to get the weight off of them once they have all that real tissue added to their body. That's been my experience. That's what I've seen. Now, once again, I don't want people to twist this up in knots. You do have to sometimes press down the gas pedal to add the size, but to maintain, as long as you train hard, as long as you follow your diet, you can maintain a fair amount of size on TRT or slightly above TRT doses. And I'm recovering horribly because I'm, I'm eating three times a day. Well, my that's also a big problem too. You're not yes. eating and my buddy Joe says it all the time. He goes, what do you expect? He like has no sympathy for me. He's like, what do you, you expect? Know, yeah, does the supplements play a role? Yeah. Yes. But yes. if you're not eating enough, you're, you're, you know, you're, yeah. you're fucking. I know. So I'm really starting to feel like these guys read my mind. He literally goes on to talk about how coming down to TRT doses or even coming off, how he can't maintain size, he can't recover, and he's having issues from being stupid and not eating enough. And when you're eating three meals a day and not getting adequate nutrients in, you aren't going to recover, you aren't going to maintain the size that you had, and you're going to increase your risk of injury if you're still trying to train the way that you were when you were enhanced. So gear works. No one's denying that. No one's denying that steroids do work and that they help add muscle, that they help you grow, but they don't do everything for you. There are many factors that you have to maintain to keep size. Training, sleep, rest, recovery, you know, protocol, your gear protocol plays into it. You know, your food, 100% your food. It, to me, I think that's the most important part. If you aren't eating, it doesn't make shit all a difference what gear you take. I've seen it over and over again. You know, it's just there's so many different things that come with bodybuilding and you know, I, I was playing with fire and I ended, you know, I wasn't doing things right. And I tore my fucking quad and, you know, now here we are. And, you know, I tear my quad, I tear my quad two days later, my gym gets a hip press. So it's like, I'm like, now I gotta. All right, guys. So one last thing here, I have a short clip from guy talking about basically sustaining his career and being stupid and doing stupid things at the end. And this is, a, I wanted to include this and in. this doesn't have really a lot to do with the whole cycle thing, but I wanted to talk about playing the long game in bodybuilding and longevity. And Guy goes on to talk about how he is happy he didn't do all the stupid stuff with cycles and press the doses super high like some of the other competitors did and end up having long-term health consequences as a result of it. He said that he has been able to maintain his health for the most part. He did have some injuries from training hard, from going a little too crazy with his training. And he tried to continue to train with the insane intensity after he retired and cut his gear and his food back that he was before. This is another point I want to make here. One, one thing that probably he's not taking into consideration is that he's in his 40s. When you hit your 40s, you cannot continue to do the same stupid crap that you could when you were in your 20s. So if you think about it, when I was 20 years old, I could go out in or 21 in college, whatever, I could go out and hammer a bottle of liquor and get up the next day and go to class and be just fine. If I did did that now, if I played a tackle football game and hammered a bottle of liquor afterwards and then tried to get up and go to work the next day, it ain't happening. I'm going to the hospital, man. My body does not work that way anymore. So you have to be more conservative and more intelligent about your approach as you get older. Bodybuilding is a long game and you have to play the long game if you want to be successful at it. What is the point in pushing the gas pedal down early on if you're just going to rag yourself out and have to retire from bodybuilding when you're 28, 29 years old? There, it, to me, it seems pointless if you can't compete as a pro or make money as a pro. What's the point in getting a pro card at that point? So, And also, you can get away with more when you're younger. And I'm not encouraging the young guys to go out and do stupid things. I think you need to play the long game. I think you need to be more intelligent about it. Take the smarter approach. It seems like Nick Walker might be taking the more intelligent approach. I know that he's changed up his training. I, from what I understand, he's dropped from the floor deadlifts. It seems like he's being more conservative with his cycles in the offseason, if we're to believe what he's saying, that he's not running orals in the offseason. He's not competing multiple times per year. You know, once or twice a year, that's all he's competing. So, a lot of the damage that you do to your body in bodybuilding is done during contest prep. 
as we've seen with the toxic cycles and with the extreme things that are done to get ready, such as dieting, cardio, all these stress that it puts on your body. So play the long game if you're serious about this and if you want to get your pro card. Think long term. There's no point in burning yourself out before you can even step on a pro stage. And for you older guys, just be more conservative with it. You can't do what the young guys do and you can't try to do those same things. You're just going to hurt yourself. All right, guys. Let me know what you think in the comments section below. Before we go, I want to give a quick shout out to my sponsor, First Detachment Nutrition. They help me pay for this channel. If you want to support me, support them. My discount code is AB10. I have a link in my profile, or I'm sorry, link in the video description below to First Detachment Nutrition. Go over there and check them out. They have awesome supplements formulated by the man himself, Justin Harris. Thank you for watching. For coaching or consultations, head over to www.anabolicbodybuilding.com to book your spot today. I can help you with optimizing hormones, fat loss, muscle gain, physique, athletic performance, nutrition, and health. For more information, shoot me an email at bigp3rd at gmail.com.